Okay, so welcome back to Hacking Pro Tips number eight. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Arnie Swinnon, um, hacker extraordinaire. Uh, again, I'm always impressed by uh, the success that others have. And so Arnie is no exception to that. Just looking at his HackerOne profile over here, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, A, I question why not, but B, I would flag, uh, he's got thanks from uh, like 11 different programs on HackerOne, which includes the Hacker Hacking Hackers badge. Uh, I, I love the web authentication endpoint uh, report that was disclosed by HackerOne, uh, which interestingly has 103 upvotes. Uh, and I, oh no, I'm not signed in. I was going to say I haven't upvoted it, but I think I have. Um, <laughs> again, we also got Uber, Shopify, Snapchat, um, and then most impressively in my mind is the Facebook work that you've done, especially on Instagram. Uh, and then you've got a couple of Google vulnerabilities that we're going to talk about as well. Um, so Arnie, I just yeah. want to say thanks very much for sitting down to do this. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time, especially with the technical difficulties that we had in the beginning <laughs> where I was playing with the microphone. Uh, so thanks. No worries. I'm, uh, it's my pleasure. So on that note, um, as I start most of the interviews, uh, why don't we get started with kind of how you got started hacking. Uh, I noticed that uh, you're on Bug Crowd and HackerOne, um, mm -hmm. and you joined HackerOne in March, but you were clearly active before that with the Instagram mm -hmm. work, uh, and then even presentation at Black Hat um, and some blog posts from 2013, so. Mm -hmm. My story, right. Um, so I started studying uh, IT here in, uh, in Belgium at the university, and they also have like specialization for security, where I got to uh, learn what buffer overflow exploits are, and also what web hacking uh, uh, is really. And that's also where I uh, gained some skills with regards to web app, uh, hacking. And when I graduated, I started as a penetration tester. That was like four years ago now. Oh. And that's when I really started into hacking web applications. And bug bounty thing is actually something that I started with last year in April of 2015. I read uh, a lot of write-ups before that, and I, I was working full time at the time, so I didn't really have a lot of time to invest. But uh, at one moment, I saw another write-up where I thought, okay, this one I would have found as well. Hmm. So uh, this intrigued me, and this this got me going at uh, at Instagram. I, I randomly picked a, a program from Facebook Bug Bounty, from which I didn't see a lot of write-ups, and that's uh, that's where I started. So that's that's why I'm. I ended up here right now. That, that's awesome. Uh, I love that story. There's so many questions I could ask. Um, <laughs> I, there's a lot of stuff I want to cover, but I could don't bring see. me, don't bring me into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, so one of the things, what was the bug that you saw that you thought that you would have been successful with that as well? Uh, which one do you mean? So when you you said you were looking at the write-ups uh, before you got into bug bounties, and you <laughs> saw one which you thought that you would be successful with as well, uh, you could have found. Right, I saw one from uh, YouTube. Uh, oh. It's, it's uh, a bug on uh, where someone was able to write a comment to a private video, I believe. It's, it was a, a classic idol, right? Oh, so switching okay. an ID, just something like that. Yeah. Which is, yeah, I've, I've been doing penetration testing for four years, which is something I've done regularly, right, for right. my customers here. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's where I figured, okay, if I would have examined YouTube myself, I might have stumbled upon this uh, on this book, and I think it got a payout of 5K. So that was also a, like quite interesting. Yeah. So uh, that's what what got me started into bug bounty actually. Okay. Okay. Nice. Um, so I'm, I'm again, I'm not going to try to jump down entirely the rabbit hole, but even the reference to Idor there, uh, and the fact that you know it was something that was common that uh, you you obviously keep a lookout for when you're doing uh, bug bounties. Um, Franz talked about it in our previous uh, interview when he and I were chatting. Um, is there anything specific for you? Is it just having an ID that's there? Is it a lookout, or is, do you have any tools, any specific methodologies? Is it or is it really just that straightforward? Yeah, it's straightforward. If uh, if you create something like on a website, you create a new video. Typically, it gets uh, some unique identifier because the the website needs to reference it somewhere. So I'm, I'm always on the lookout for unique identifiers, and certainly if they are like uh, incremental, yeah. it gets really interesting. So that's, that was the case with YouTube, and it's, it's still the case with many, many uh, websites uh, nowadays. Right, right. Nice. But yeah, it's, it's not rocket science. I don't have special tools or anything. It's just running Burp Suite or even Zap Proxy and, and looking out for the IDs and yeah. swapping them. It's, uh, I know when I'm doing it, um, for those that are new, uh, whenever I see that, that idea, that integer, um, I will usually always just throw it to Burp, Burp Intruder 
um, throw the payload around that, and then just let it. Um, I usually just do a minus one, so I decrement down just because it's, it's easier. Um, but yeah, so that's my methodology for looking at them. Yeah. Um, what I also often do is like I create two accounts. Yeah. Uh, I keep I keep note of the integers or or the IDs for for similar objects of the two accounts, and then start looking for horizontal privilege escalation. That's typically uh, also a method. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a great tip. Um, and Mark Litchfield also just uh, mentioned that in the HackerOne uh, blog as well. Um, so it seems to be a common methodology between the, the great bug hunters uh, to have those two accounts and uh, play with the integers between them. Um, so um, I, I, you obviously have the formal education. You were doing penetration testing. Um, mm -hmm. And you came from uh, the history of, of trying to get into games. Uh, is there anything that you've learned, say, since you started, I guess, last year, um, that you wish you knew now, um, or sorry, that you wish you knew when you started, but that you know now. Like, what, what's, has there been that education level increase uh, when you started bug hunting? Is there anything new, or really did penetration testing prepare you for it? Well, penetration testing definitely prepared me for trying to be creative and try to look for the common bug. So I did know about IDORs, cross site scripting, CSRF, and stuff like that. What it didn't really prepare me for is uh, like the newer things, right? So you have OAuth, which is kind of a big thing in the bug bounty uh, world because many programs have OAuth authentication. Yeah. But in my penetration testing work, I was mainly working uh, for uh, companies in the financial industry in Belgium. Typically, banks don't allow you to log in with your Facebook profile. <laughs> not yet. Let's, uh, let's wait and see how, uh, how it goes in the future. But that's not the case. So I, I didn't have any ID, for example, uh, from OAuth authentication bugs or OAuth, OAuth bugs in general. Yeah. Uh, another thing I can uh, I can see, which is very different from penetration testing, is the scope. So if you're doing a penetration test, the scope is pretty narrow. It's like this product, this URL, this domain, nothing else. While with bug bounty hunting, there's often a wildcard in a domain name, uh, which is in scope, or sometimes even with a couple of programs, uh, there's literally no well-defined scope. Uh, the scope, for example, of Riot Games uh, is anything that affects uh, one of our players negatively. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be anything, and it's definitely much different from penetration testing. And it also, yeah, uh, I had to improve uh, this piece of skills from mine because I didn't have any uh, in that field, like uh, subdomain takeovers, to, to name one uh, that Frank discussed. Yeah. It doesn't exist in penetration testing, so that's definitely a uh, it, that's definitely a, a big difference. So, it's a uh, yeah. That, that's the main two things. I think. So, in terms of the learning about those two things, has it been really from write-ups from others, um, or like what does that look like? Like, how do you go out and like how a, how do you identify OAuth as something, um, and then when you identify it as something you want to learn about, where where have you gone to then increase those skills? Well, typically, I, I try to use write-ups of other researchers as hooks for new ideas. So I, I, I tend to, to try to read all the write-ups that, that are published, which are many these, these days. Yeah. And once I find one, like OAuth related, I didn't know anything about OAuth. Then I decided, OK, this is interesting. I think I understand the bug, but I need to understand OAuth fully, right? Mm -hmm. So I try to read more about it. You have a dedicated website, OAuthSecurity.com, which is full of, uh, full of information. Yeah. And the OAuth thingy, I also like, experimented by creating some applications over at Google and Facebook to really see the developer side of things. Oh, nice. OAuth. So that also learns you a couple of tricks that aren't documented yet. Nice. That's, um, I think that's a huge tip. Um, and it mm -hmm. kind of goes back to the idea uh, that's come out of other interviews, is that having the developer perspective when you're mm -hmm. bug hunting um, is really invaluable, right? It allows you to put yourself in their mindset and see where the potential um, potential for errors is, really, uh, and vulnerabilities. So uh, again, yeah, I, I would flag that for for those listening. Um, if you haven't played with development, go out and do it. And that's a great example. OAuth. I know File Descriptor has mentioned that to me as well, um, mm -hmm. uh, because OAuth no. is an area that I've wanted to get into, and I think it'll be added to the book. Uh, next. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the book, by the way. Oh, thank yeah, you. I, le I learned many things about, about it as well. So, things like uh, Amazon S3 bucket takeovers, it also typically doesn't exist in penetration testing. So, right. these are really the things that, that, I, that I, I love to, to learn about. Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy how one thing leads to another, right? Like, it's, mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. remember talking with a couple other people, and I think in the 
in the book I mentioned going down the rabbit hole and uh, <laughs> was, somebody has said to me, uh, you know, maybe that's kind of got a negative connotation, but I still think of it like that. Like it's, you start uh, one thing and these doors just keep opening. Um, uh, it's an impressive book. Thank you. I appreciate it. Really appreciate that. <laughs> um, so when I was going through your blog, um, and one of the things that struck me, because again, this is those areas that I don't have a lot of uh, experience in, but it's so common, I really should. Um, you had mentioned there's, there's a blog there talking about searching for SQL injections. Um, mm -hmm. So it's from 2013. You talked about using Burp Intruder, um, and you had recommended looking at the time-based um, uh -huh. vulnerabilities. So the idea, for those that aren't aware, uh, with the time-based is that you essentially send a query that will take an excessive amount of time to return and then when you're looking at your execution times uh, it'll stick out like a, like a sore thumb you'll see explicitly here's a longer query which indicates um, SQL injection vulnerability so I guess my question for you is is burp intruder still your preferred choice um, do you still go after SQL injections um, and has that changed anything along those is it still time-based for you that you're looking at well, to be honest, uh, with the bug bounty programs, uh, I'm not really focusing on SQL injection okay. now because I'm more uh, putting my focus on more mature programs, okay. and they tend to have less SQL injection vulnerabilities because, yeah, like the, the development frameworks, they have yeah. transparent solutions for them now, mm -hmm. with like prepared statements and, and things like that. So I don't tend to focus that much anymore on, on identifying SQL injections, but I do still uh, like the method of the, the time-based uh, payloads or the Boolean-based uh, bail, uh, Boolean payloads that I mentioned in my blog post. Yeah. They, they really allow you to do a, a spot check and, and it's, it's easy to, to identify them with uh, tools like Burke and Sugar. Now that being said, there's a bit of development in the SQL injection uh, detection methods. So you also have like out of band side channels uh, like DNS that you can use, but typically uh, time based and boolean based have worked uh, the best for me. But again, uh, I don't think I haven't found the SQL injection vulnerability in the bug bounty program scene yet, and I'm I'm not really focusing on it uh, to be honest at, at the moment. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I know when I when I've done mine, as I mentioned, I I haven't really focused on them as well. Um, I know others have been successful, especially when you kind of get that, that feeling that a program has a very dated site. Um, yeah. You mentioned kind of having star dot. Um, that, I think that's where you can sometimes find those. Yeah, um, definitely. It, a lot of sites I'm looking at are using, you know, Rails, Django, whatnot, and Drupal even. Um, uh -huh. And again, you're right in that there's a lot of protection there for the developer. Um, you had mentioned the DNS, the blind, um, for the benefit of those listening. Uh, just can you give a brief recap on kind of what that's referring to? Right. So, for example, with Oracle SQL, uh, if you're an Oracle database, you can have a query that like sends the result or, or sends uh, some information to an external domain name, like a uh, DNS. You, you can supply it in your payload, like artistwilliam.net. Mm. Uh, I supply it in my payload, and if the injection succeeds and occurs, it will. Uh, first of all, make a DNS request to get the IP address of this domain name, and then if it's allowed by, by egress uh, policies, it will send out the, the information. Now, the egress policies, like the firewall, um, it often does not allow databases to exfiltrate data, mm. but it typically does allow DNS lookups. This is uh, one technique that you can use with SQL injection, but it's, it's also very effective with uh, XXP, yeah. so with uh, XML entity injection. Um, it's also quite powerful because typically XML gateways are not always allowed to exfiltrate data, so to send data out of the network, but DNS lookups, I've, I've almost never seen them uh, being blocked. So that allows you to at least identify the vulnerability and then you'll have to find a way around it to, uh, to really exfiltrate data. But even with DNS, it's possible. Oh, crazy. That's, uh, that's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for, yeah. for clarifying that. I think there are some GitHub um, projects about it, but basically, if you want to exfiltrate data with DNS, what you do is you pick the data, you base64 encode it, and then do a lookup to subdomain the base64 encoded data that you want to exfiltrate, dot .net. Yeah. And then, if I'm running my own DNS server, I see the DNS request coming in, and I see the data coming in. But that's, that's already a bit of a, a more advanced technique, but uh, I've seen it working, uh, I believe, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there has been a, a post on Reddit about it as well. Oh, nice. But, uh, but again, it's kind of that idea that 
just open the door a crack here and then we have the opportunity to kind of go learn about it more. Because um, I have seen reference to uh, the DNS perspective of it, but admittedly, it's same with OAuth. Um, it's one of those things that just kind of makes my head hurt. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, I've never dove into it. And uh, I kind of kick myself for taking that approach to OAuth um, because once you wrap your head around it, you see so much potential there. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's the same thing here. So really appreciate you explaining that, not only for me, but also uh, everybody else listening. Mm -hmm. That's great. I had the same feeling with OAuth. So I didn't know it. Uh, I had to learn about it. And uh, yeah, it takes some time. I, I read the pages. I put it away for a couple of, of days or weeks. I regret them to really let it uh, sink in, and after a while, uh, I get it, and, and it's really, uh, yeah, it's the authentication part of, a, of an application, and typically, uh, yeah, it has a high impact if you can compromise it in one way or another. Yeah, that's, uh, I've seen that as well. My uh, tip for those listening is uh, I also tend to look at the two-factor authentication, um, mm -hmm. because a lot of times, at least in my experience, um, there's some type of problem there. Um, yeah. And because that's something that's really hard to get right as well. Um, mm -hmm. So again, yeah, authentication is, is really um, a large area because it, there's a lot of potential, right? If you can kind of mitigate mm -hmm. those checks and balances, you have access to people's accounts, right? And so yeah, um, and that's 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 also one thing I'd like to share. Authentication, like all authentication, it's it's everywhere, right? It's not yeah. limited to one program. Whereas if you have to find an IDOR, you really have to deep dive into an application. You have to understand it, you have to understand the object and, and things like that. With OAuth, it's pretty much you learn it once and you apply it everywhere. Or at least, yeah, nowadays, a lot of the, the OAuth uh, implementations are existing on, on many bug bounty programs. So that's that's also one thing I, I like. It scales very, very well. That's a great point. Um, and it's obviously don't want to get, this seems to be a conversation that's come up uh, in a number of chats that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's too philosophical, so we won't go down the rabbit hole. But there's the whole mm -hmm. idea of with bug bounties, say finding like a zero day and then reporting that to every single program. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've seen arguments on both sides of the coin. I'm not necessarily sure that I agree with the idea of reporting it to every program. Mm -hmm. um, but OAuth is kind of that idea where if you understand the methodology, you understand everything behind it, it's not that you're finding a zero day, it's that the developers are responsible for implementing it correctly. And exactly. so it offers you that potential to go out and look at all the bug bounty programs and achieve the same result, but not in that kind of gray area on bug mm -hmm. bounties, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I completely agree. So with OAuth, for example, the redirect URI, yeah. it's a developer's... Uh, decision on, on what to enter here so it's like a configuration issue if there's an issue there it's not a zero day yeah it's typically linked to a mistake of the company based on the documentation of the OAuth implement uh, like the, the OAuth provider yeah. so that's that's really interesting bugs for bug bounty enter because they scale and you won't it's not like a zero day yeah so that, that's that's something I, uh, yeah i'm definitely uh, looking at exactly exactly so going back to the blog um you have uh, a couple awesome write-ups on CTF, uh, hack LU 2013 CTF, um, and it's a web exploit. And so mm -hmm. we're not going to go into the details of that because it's, I mean, <laughs> for me, knowing that you had the penetration background testing, um, it, that explains so much because <laughs> the write-up that you have is, it's mind-boggling. Um, I took a long time to actually digest everything and just the thought process. But <laughs> besides that, I'm curious, <laughs> Um, were CTFs is something that you've been doing um, with the penetration testing? Uh, others have talked about it, and do you see that again building uh, your experience and providing value in bug bounties? Well, indeed, CTFs have been, is something that I've I've been doing while I was at the university. So the university where I went to here in uh, in Belgium was KU Leuven, and uh, they actually have a dedicated CTF team. So they oh. try to to your students who are studying IT into participating in their CTF team, like a recruitment process. Mm -hmm. And they're actually pretty well known. They're named Hack, uh, no, Hackman style. Okay. Right? It's, uh, in, the, in the CTF scene, they are known as a pretty good team. It's not the best, but, uh, but they are, there are some very skilled, uh, skilled people there. And that's where I got into it. So like last two years, my five years that I was studying, I, I really got into CTFing. Okay. And it really helped me develop my technical skills because I merely had like theoretical um, knowledge at the time, but no really hands-on uh, 
experience and CTFs really helped me in, in that respect. So it helped me on one hand to further improve my um, assembly skills and buffer overflow skills because in CTFs you typically have also a couple of categories like buffer overflows or, or low level exploits that you need to implement also web based attacks and the write up that on my block is actually a combination of both. Yeah. And yeah, it, it definitely helped me personally to, to develop a real, real hand-on skills. And so when you were doing that, when you were doing the CTFs, because you talk about it being team-based, um, mm -hmm. were you learning from others? Like were you doing, or even the write-up that you had, was it just you working through that? Um, no, uh, I indeed uh, cooperated with a couple of colleagues at the time, because at the time I wasn't studying anymore, but I, I was still participating in the CTFs. Yeah. But uh, definitely in the beginning at the university, there was like a team of more skilled people who were doing this, uh, who were doing this for a couple of years already. And they were teaching like the new students on how to proceed. And it really definitely helped to uh, spice up my skills in a, in a very quick way. Because yeah. learning from others, we were always meeting physically in a room at the university. So it's, it's a lot easier at that moment. You share pizza, you share a, a Coke, <laughs> and you share knowledge. And it's, uh, yeah, it goes, it works pretty well. Yeah, nice. That's, uh, yeah, it's, I know there's always talk about kind of the CTFs and doing them together. Um, but A, like once you're kind of out of that, the school atmosphere and that kind of thing, it's, it's hard to find the time. Um, yeah. But uh, usually there's a few, a few hackers who are around who want to kind of do that. I've seen that chatted about a few times. Um, so, I mean, maybe it's a personal question, maybe it's not, you can always defer it, but uh -huh. so you had, you had blog posts in 2014, uh, big gap, and then you started again in 2016. So, um, again, if it's personal, just pass, mm -hmm. but I'm curious, uh, like what happened with the gap? Um, and knowing that you started in 2015 with bug bounties, uh, it kind of explains starting back up in 2016. Yeah, exactly. So in 2013, um, I changed employers right okay. after my, my blog post. So I changed to uh, another consultancy company for pen testing here in Belgium. And it was like a good two years of uh, a lot of work, let's say. But uh, I also, I was doing penetration testing for clients. And typically, uh, you don't have responsible disclosure with a penetration test, right? You sign an NDA. Yeah. Even if you find something very nice, you can it's hard to share it because yeah. uh, if you cannot really give technical screenshots and stuff like that, it doesn't make a lot of sense. If you have to really do a very generic blog post, there's not much added value to it. That was at least my reasoning. Plus, I also uh, I was quite busy at the time. I was organizing a, a CTF competition for students in Belgium. Maybe we can talk about that later. Oh, we're but going to, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, that one as well, uh, the Cybersecurity Challenge Belgium, yeah. that also took a lot of my time. So. Uh, there's, there was not too much to, to blog about. Um, but when I started with the, the actually the, the bug bounties from Instagram, I also chose Instagram and Facebook bug bounty because they allow responsible disclosure. And that was one of the things I, I do like to share a couple of things that I've found because I really appreciate that others are sharing. So yeah. it's also a big thing that, uh, that influenced my decision at that moment. It's definitely, um there's a lot that I want to talk to you about um, from that perspective because uh, we're not. Gonna, I don't want to get. I want to get ahead of ourselves. But I know that you you donated some of your bounties um, when you found the Instagram stuff. You you started the competition, and again, you're blogging about interesting bugs that you found. And so I'm, we're going to circle back. But I'm, I'm really interested in the charitable perspective of it because it's something that I've learned a lot about, uh, or how I've increased my skills. Um, so I'm going to table that. But yeah, yeah, we're definitely going to come back to that. Um, I, one of the things that's been burning on my mind, um, and this is really something like, so before you and I had ever chatted, um, mm -hmm. I, can't, I came across your B-Sides San Francisco chat where you actually walked through the, uh, the Instagram work that you had done. Um, uh -huh. And so for those that aren't aware, those that haven't watched it, A, I would say, again, pause the video, go watch it now uh, mm -hmm. because there's a ton of stuff that's in there for people to learn from. Uh, that's valuable. Uh, as as an anecdote to that, when I was watching it, uh, I would do it when I was walking to work, and so mm -hmm. a few mm -hmm. times I almost crossed the street into traffic, not paying attention because I got so into the presentation. Uh, so that's how much I recommend it. But not only that, um, the thing that like struck me was your perseverance when you did this, um, mm -hmm. and you talk about it for you know maybe the first third of the video, 
Um, but it's really Instagram had a, a number of protections just to try to stop you from intercepting their traffic. Mm -hmm. um, and so in your presentation, you're talking about it and the presentation takes you know 20 minutes to discuss it. And the thing that I love is you have the diagram that shows what the process would have looked like, right? Just a bunch yeah. of circles, random stuff, arrow out. Um, whereas the perception is going to be the straight line. So I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you, um, where does that perseverance come from? Um, like what made you keep going there as opposed to like, screw this, I can't keep doing this. Um, and was there ever a point where it was like, ah, you know what, forget it, I'm done. Um, mm -hmm. what, what was that like for you? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. And you're not the first to ask me, but uh, basically, yeah, I told you about the, the write-up I read uh, on YouTube, which frustrated me a bit, not really frustrated, but it was like an incentive to start with. So I just, uh, I picked out Instagram because I didn't find a lot of write-ups about it yet. So I figured, okay, or it must be very secure or nobody has, has given it a decent look. <laughs> so I was really, I was convinced that my choice for Instagram was the right one at the time. Okay. They also allow its responsible disclosure and there's not, not so many problems who allowed it at the time. So yeah, that's why I, I went for Instagram and then I, I deep dived and exactly I, I came across some, some hurdles. Now, I didn't, to be honest, I'm, I, I was not a mobile expert at the moment, so I also had to invest some time, but I did have some experience with like SSL pinning and, and a bit of uh, debugging uh, an APK. So I did have some background knowledge that helped me proceed a bit faster than, than someone without it. Okay. And yeah, I, I thought, okay, this is maybe the reason why there hasn't been too many write-ups about Instagram. Because there are some hurdles and maybe people have quit here. So let's say that I, I'll, I'll just proceed. Uh, in the end, I, I'll get there and maybe I'll find, uh, I'll find some juicy stuff, which eventually I, I found some, some interesting uh, vulnerabilities. So it paid out in the end. Uh, it out very well in the end for me. Nice. But yeah, I, I've had moments, of course, where I thought, okay, fuck it, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave it here. Yeah. You can beat that out, of course. But, um, <laughs> no, I like it. It's good. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it here, and then I put it away for a couple of days or weeks, and then uh, after a while, I think of a new uh, potential attack vector or potential solution to the problem I was facing, and then I went back. So that, that happened a couple of times. I think mm. I did like a sweep of Instagram three times in total. So a sweep first time for bugs. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't find any criticals at that moment. I just put it away for a couple of weeks and then I go over it again. And because you know the program and you know the, the application better, it allowed me to think one step further at that moment. Hmm. And yeah, the, the second sweep, I found the most critical vulnerabilities uh, just because yeah, there were some speci specialities about them and uh, yeah, only at that moment I was mature enough to, to identify them with uh, mature enough with with, uh, with the web application. Nice, that's um, that it it resonates a lot with me uh, because there have been times where you get frustrated and for me it's it's an opportunity like you know I'll walk the dogs or I'll mm -hmm. be doing something yeah. where it's almost like you don't think about bug bounties and then suddenly you realize that your mind has come back to it and something kind of hits you or you read a write up exactly. or you see someone else's disclosure and it, it sparks something for you. Um, so again, it's, I want to emphasize that as a, as a tip for people is that not all of the bug bounty work or success that you're going to have is going to be when you're at the computer, right? Um, exactly. So don't be afraid to kind of take that break. Um, at least that's exactly, exactly what I, I hear from you. Um, yeah. Completely agree. For example, the premium numbers uh, attack that I yeah. found, I didn't find it immediately. I just noticed, I, I was monitoring for new functionality at Instagram and I noticed they, they implemented like the calling feature to link your mobile number to, to the app. Yeah. It didn't immediately come up with a successful or interesting attack factor, but I thought about this a couple of days later when I, when I was doing non-bug bounty related uh, stuff, personal stuff, and I just, it, it stumbled upon me, and this, is, this could be, this could work, and this is how I, how I figured it out. It was not like immediately an ID, but it, it had to grow. Nice. That's, uh, I love, I love that. Um, so A, that you found it on, on Instagram, um, but then that you went out and you tested the other areas as well, right? Because um, it's the same idea, um, where it's just incorrectly implemented, right? And so, uh, for those that aren't aware, um, again, you should have paused it and gone read the uh -huh. and watched the video. But uh, you registered a premium number, 
And because these companies would call to verify, they would call your premium number um, and you could scale this and just start essentially, um, lack of a better term, stealing money from uh, <laughs> these corporations, uh, which is cool. Um, so it's, it, it was hap I was glad to read that um, some of them rewarded you, uh, whereas others mm -hmm. didn't, um, which seems to be the case. It's, it's odd with bug bounties. Some companies really care when you attack them uh, as uh -huh. opposed to uh, attacking their clients or whatnot. So, but uh, yeah. we can leave that for discussion for another day. <laughs> um, but you talked about SSL pinning. And so for uh -huh. those that aren't aware, um, the idea with SSL pinning, and you know more than I do, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But mm -hmm. when you're using your phone, um, there's a, we'll say a, its own certificate um, storage. And so mm -hmm. with SSL pinning, the app, rather than use the phone certificate uh, storage system, it will have its own uh, certificate. And so as a result, you can't add the burp certificate to that APK. It won't use it. And so you never see the traffic that's coming through. It's all, mm -hmm. it's all blocked because it doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. Again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, with your um, work on Instagram, you developed an ad hoc Wi-Fi network. And so yep. to me, that was something new. I haven't really seen any articles that, that talk about that. I've seen mm -hmm. reference to actually just the other day, bypassing pinning by using the logging function in Android. So deconstructing mm -hmm. the Smalley code and then adding yep. it to the request and doing it that way. Um, mm -hmm. But A, so I'm curious, can, can you tell us a little bit about the ad hoc Wi-Fi network, what that was all about um, mm -hmm. and why that came to you uh, and why you chose that approach? Okay. So basically when I started with Instagram, I also tried to yeah, configure my intercepting proxy on the same Wi-Fi network, like pointing it to my bird. Yeah. And I could, when I was browsing on my uh, mobile test device, I could see the requests coming, uh, flowing through my burp on my MacBook, so it all was working well. But when I, uh, when I tried to log in and, and use Instagram, I wasn't seeing the traffic, but it was still functioning. Oh, okay. So at that moment, it, there was no SSL thing. Um, it was just, it was ignoring the, the proxy settings of my Android phone. Hmm. Android phone, right? So I figured out, okay, or I'll have to deep dive into the Smiley code and, and try to find out where they, are, where they are ignoring the proxy setting because it's, a, it's like a flag in an API call in Android, but once it's compiled into, uh, into Smiley, it's, it's not that easy to find. Okay. And the problem with Instagram was also if you hot patch Smiley code, they actually had some detection mechanism to see whether the signature of their uh, Android package uh, was the same, hmm. right? So they, they have some measure to to, to see whether the package has been tampered with. So that was also, again, you can you can find the routine that, the routine that does this check and also patch it, but it's a lot of work. So I, yeah. I actually thought, okay, how can I ensure that even when it's not obeying the proxy settings of my Android phone, how can I ensure that I'm still man in the middle and I, that I still see traffic flowing through my bird feed? Yeah. And the idea that came to me is, okay, I'll, I'll just ensure that I'm physically between the phone and the internet and the ad hoc Wi-Fi uh, wi wireless network was was the most suitable way for me. Yeah, it was it was the most convenient way to do it. And I also had to do some wireless penetration testing while I was a penetration tester. So yeah. that helped me to to not be too afraid of it. And actually, it's it's not it's not very very difficult with a MacBook. Uh, it's it's almost built-in functionality. Hmm. Crazy. So. Um... Maybe this is a basic question. Maybe it's a dumb question. But is it this? Is it the same idea as say like monitoring network traffic with something like Wireshark? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly the same. So if I open my Wireshark at the moment, I would see all the traffic being generated by uh, by my mobile phone. Right. And what I did is okay. So what the setup was: I had my MacBook, I had it connected to internet with a, a wired cable. Yeah. And then I just chose share share the internet connection. Okay. which makes the ad hoc wireless network. It's built in in, uh, in Mac OS. It's not something difficult to do. Yeah. And at that moment, I just connected with my mobile test device on the ad hoc network with the password I set up. Yeah. And at that moment, I was physically man in the middle with my MacBook. Right. right. So that helped. And just one more trick to pipe all the HTTP and HTTPS traffic to um, Burp Suite was uh, two lines of, of, of the firewall um, uh, binary which is installed uh, on macOS. So it's just two lines of, of redirection uh, configuration that redirected all the traffic to port 80 and 88 and 443 to, uh, to localhost 80 and uh, 443 which where my burp suite was listening. So it's technically it was not very uh, 
impressive, but it, it worked and it still works for me uh, with Instagram at the moment. Yeah, no, it sounds interesting. It almost, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm interested to try it myself as well um, because it seems like it would just be something to do to overcome SSL pinning as opposed to decompiling and kind of going through all of those steps, right? Well, no, it's it's not like that because SSL pinning is, is even a bit different. Okay. So this was just the fact that the personal mobile phone, so like the, the Android, no, the Instagram Android application, it was ignoring the proxy settings of the mobile test device, my Android test device. But it, it still didn't have SSL pinning. This oh, was just okay. to become man in the middle to see the traffic. I see. Right? In a later iteration, like a couple of months after I started pen testing Instagram or examining Instagram, then they implemented SSL pinning, and even then I couldn't see the traffic anymore. Oh, so okay. that's where I also had to um, really go through hot patching, uh, hot patching the smiley codes um, yeah. to really filter that out. So it's actually two different bypasses that I had to do. But uh, the second one, the SSL implementation, the SSL pinning, was only uh, a couple months after. So. It didn't uh, didn't bother me at the time. Nice. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because I thought if it was that straightforward, it would, you you see it popping up everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Admittedly, SSL um, and the encryption side of all of that is another topic that makes my head hurt. Um, but I should probably get into it. Uh, there was a great um, podcast uh, from Risky Business that was just talking about um, that kind of idea with certificates and, and whatnot. Anyways, it's a plug for them, um, and I recommend people listen to the podcast if they haven't. Um, so, um, I, we don't have to go too far down into it, but so that was kind of the first hurdle, was that piece. But then you also found that there was the, the signatures that were going out on the requests. Um, yeah. So, I, I'm curious about, about that, um, how you got past the, that hurdle. Um, but then also, you, you wrote your own Burp, Burp plugin. And so it's unsurprising now that I hear you talk about kind of your background. Um, but I, I'm curious, again, same idea. Is, was that something that came to your mind immediately? Um, mm -hmm. And when you're bug hunting now, does the programming background of yours come in routinely handy? Um, like Burp plugins being an example, but you also mm -hmm. have other write-ups and examples where you've done quick coding to demonstrate um, a proof of concept. Yeah. No, uh, indeed. So the, the signature thing of Instagram was, okay, if the application is sending a request, it's actually not encrypting the parameters, it's just sending the parameters as is in the clear, but it's also adding a, an additional post parameter signature. Right. And it's like, it's a concatenation of all the parameters and then uh, an HMAC calculation with a secret key, and that's a signature. And it's being verified at the server's end, so if the signature is not correct, it would just not process the request. It's like really mm. uh, a, a global hook uh, for any incoming post request on the server side. Mm. So this required me to, one, find the key in the binary because it's embedded somewhere because it's generating the signature. Mm -hmm. And two, once when I had the key, I had to use it because in the end, as a penetration tester, to examine Instagram, you want to fiddle with the request. You want to fiddle with the, yeah. with the values of parameters. And if I fiddled with it without uh, paying attention to the signature, the signature would be wrong and the request would not have been accepted. So once I got uh, the embedded key, which uh, I found in an in a embedded library uh, in the Instagram app, it's maybe a bit too, too, <laughs> too deep down the rabbit hole to go there. No, but no. I, found a, I found a key basically in the, in the Instagram Android client. Yeah. And then, of course, I have the key, but I still have to use it. Uh, and I didn't want to recalculate manually always the hash for each uh, request that I, I fiddled with in Burp. So I wrote an extension who did it for me automatically. And basically, writing of Burp extensions is not as hard as, as you would expect. They have great documentation. And I had to look that during the years of penetration testing, I also already had to do it uh, before. So I had some experience, so I was not too afraid. And I knew, okay, this API of them it has the, cap the capability to hook into all outgoing requests and then modify a parameter, which was exactly what I needed to oh. hot patch the outgoing signature. Yeah. So that's actually, it it's, it's, uh, sounds more impressive than it was. It, it was like 20 lines of code, uh, Java code, and then uh, just uh, compiled to a jar file uh, as a verb plugin. Cool. Um, 
to answer your second question, indeed, uh, the development skills. Now, I'm, I'm not a great developer, but I, I can write buggy code, let's say. <laughs> so indeed, I, I know a bit of Java, which I learned uh, at the university. I know a bit of Python, which I learned uh, on the job. And especially Python has helped me to make some quick and dirty uh, proof of concept. For example, uh, a brute force script in Python that I wrote and, and I reported uh, to HackerOne. Yeah. It's dirty, it's quick, but it does the job. So that's that's something that really uh, really helps me, uh, yeah, find and, and report a decent proof of concept. Nice. That's um, I, I've seen that from uh, a number of different, um, you know, great hackers, right? Um, especially when you're reading great write-ups and you see companies that say, you know, that actually provide that feedback when they're disclosed. Um, so again, I, I would encourage. Uh, those that are new to bug bounties to even just watch tutorials, get an idea of kind of what's going on. Um, JavaScript uh, is particularly effective in my mind um, because a um, a lot of times JavaScript there's vulnerabilities there for you to play with. So if you know how to read it and look at it, um, but b also uh, it helps with um, uh, providing exploits. Um, for web applications and whatnot. So mm -hmm. if you know how to do it, even if it's quick and dirty, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, so that's a good call. I appreciate you uh, sharing that. Mm -hmm. So um, so we talked about if there was ever a point where you wanted to walk away. Um, and so uh, debating here because some of my notes are around going down uh, mm -hmm. into the vulnerabilities. So why don't we, why don't we talk about that? Um, so you found nine vulnerabilities. Um, one thing that was interesting to me was so when you talked about the Instagram subdomain hijacking on the local network, yeah. you reported it, but you physically had to be on the same network. So they said, no, thanks. Mm -hmm. You had said in the presentation uh, in San Francisco was that you kind of gave up, but you wish you hadn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the first vulnerability. So again, going back to the kind of that perseverance, what was it um, like? How did it feel to get the rejection? But then also mm -hmm. know that had you kept with it, you would have found it, right? Like, yeah. And then you continued on. You found seven, eight more after that. So, so what is that like? What is that process like? Uh, and why did you walk away? Mm -hmm. So maybe to, to wrap up the vulnerability that we were discussing. Yeah. Basically, I found a couple of DNS records from Instagram subdomains who were resolving to a ten, ten dot star uh, IP address, which is like a private IP address in a local network only. Mm -hmm. And I figured, okay, if I can claim this IP address on the local network of my victim, and they browse to this. Uh, to this domain, to the subdomain, I'll receive their request, and if they're logged in into Instagram, I'll also receive their session cookie because the browser adds it transparently. So basically, it's a, a session hijack vulnerability, but it indeed requires a local local access and the ability to claim an IP address on the local network, which is not straightforward. Hmm. So it was one of the first vulnerabilities I found with Instagram, and I figured, okay, why not? Let's report it and, and let's see uh, how it ends. But I did figure out that it, it might not get accepted because it's a, it's a far fetch, let's be honest. Uh, you, uh, you need to have a local or you need to be close to your victim in the same local network and be able to claim an IP address, which isn't straightforward uh, all the time. So I did expect somehow the, the rejection, but at the time I was really new to bug bounty, so I didn't know how, how they would react. So it was also like a test case for me to see what is the level of acceptance. Okay. Now, the problem with one of these subdomains that was resolving to a 10 dot star address was that after a while, someone else um, monitored it. And after a while, it started resolving not to a, a private IP address, but to a public one. Hmm. And uh, it was graphite.instagram.com. And yeah. eventually, um, Wes, uh, uh, Wes Weinberg, I believe, he found um, yeah, a, a live application running on the subdomain, which was an outdated, uh, an outdated GitHub project, I believe which had some, some flaws and some default uh, secret uh, settings, secret configurations on the application, they were still there. Facebook didn't, uh, or, or Instagram team didn't change it. So it allowed them to overtake the subdomain, RCE, and even in the end, grab a lot of uh, sensitive data from Instagram, like source code and, and yeah. SSL keys and stuff like that. So yeah, of course, when reading this write-up, I was a bit of, uh, yeah, I, I, I cursed, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But it did motivate me because I knew, okay, I found the subdomain as well. I had to brute force it. It was not like uh, published published anywhere on, on Google. So I really had to brute force it. I did find it. I just found it too early, right? It, right? it was only later. 
So this incentivized me to write a, a quick and dirty Python script, here we are again, yeah. to keep on monitoring uh, for DNS changes. So that's what I'm basically doing now. So I have, I have like a list of subdomains from the, the typical tools, subroot and sublister. And uh, yeah, we all use them, I think, at Big Bounty Hunters to identify this code. Yeah. And I also run this script daily to see, okay, are there any changes from those that are resolving to private IP addresses to public IP addresses? Because yeah. once it changed, I will definitely check him. I haven't had luck with that with it uh, until now, but yeah, I, that's definitely one thing I learned from uh, from this book that uh, it, you need to step up your game uh, if you want to be first. That's that's awesome. Yeah, um, it, I'm, it's funny that you mentioned that because that was going to be my next question. Was uh, you know have you started doing that, doing the automated checking? Um, uh, because I know to be honest, um, I've seen uh, resolve to ten dot star, um, yeah, and I knew it was a problem. Um, but I didn't know why or how or anything like that. And so I've always just kind of walked away from them. But that mm -hmm. tip now is kind of like, oh, you know what? I need to start taking a note um, and same idea. Um, I've walked away with a couple other interviews and realized that the automation game has to step up a little bit. Um, you got to start developing your own tools. So that's interesting. Um, nice. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. No problem. And the one thing that, that made me report this to Instagram, actually, the, the subtlety is on the main domain, www.instagram.com, when you were logging in, it was giving you a session cookie, right? In exchange for your credentials. Yeah. And the session cookie, typically, as bug bounty hunters, we always look for two attributes, like secure attribute to see yeah. whether it's only uh, sent over HTTPS, and the HTTP only attribute to see whether it's, it's allowed to be read by JavaScript or not. Yeah. Actually, there's a third attribute, which I also like to look at, and it's a domain attribute. Mm. And domain attribute, if it's set on a cookie and it's set to a specific value like dot and then the top level domain, so dot Instagram.com, actually it's instructing browsers, all modern browsers obey the specification, to send a session cookie to all subdomains. So not yeah. only www.instagram.com, but literally all subdomains. And what uh, I've used it for is if you can overtake a subdomain of Instagram.com, for example, through the resolving of a on a local network of a of a ten dot star uh, IP address, or even if you have a, a normal subdomain takeover like Francis does with a Heroku or, or anything like that, yeah. if they browse to your overtaken subdomain, they will send the session cookie along, and you can you can use it. You can copy paste it in your own browser as an attacker, and you can hijack their session. So that's that's like an added impact um, to to subdomain takeover, which I've been able to to use a couple of times and, and report a couple of times, and that this really increases the impact of subdomain takeover considerably because it's from subdomain takeover to session takeover, which is like authentication bypass issue. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, especially, I don't, I don't know, I guess the ones that come to my mind um, recently for subdomain takeover and even talking with people, um, it's always kind of like I can host my content there, but mm -hmm. it, it almost doesn't, maybe they didn't look at it, maybe it wasn't the case, um, but if you're right, if you have the star dot, or I guess it's not it's just dot uh, the domain yeah. name, you don't need any interaction. It doesn't matter that you can host your content there because you can just grab the session uh, information. Yeah. Um, Basically, what, what I've reported once to a private program is I, I took a subdomain, right? And they had on their top level domain, they had the session uh, cookie being shared with all the subdomains. And they also had like a forum where you could post um, content and images. So I posted an image which was hosted on the overtaken subdomain. Yeah. And as soon as anyone saw my post on the forum, they were actually silently making the request to the hijacked subdomain. And they were silently submitting their session cookie along if they were logged in, which, which was a requirement to visit the forum. Yeah. So this was basically an uh, uh, authentication bypass with few user interaction, which was, of course, it's a, it's a bigger impact than a normal subdomain takeover where you can only uh, control the yeah well, the HTML and JavaScript that you're hosting there. Yeah, exactly. And again, for those that are new, anytime you have the opportunity to reduce user interaction and still achieve the vulnerability, you're going <laughs> exactly. to be increasing your payout. Um, companies exactly. are going to be much more aware of that. Um, mm -hmm. Because essentially, yeah, just reduce the steps that somebody has to interact with. Uh, that's awesome. Thanks thanks for sharing that. That's, uh, <laughs> that's really cool. Um, so, the other thing is on the web server directory enumeration. Um, so the idea there was you could start identifying all the um, server uh, directories that exist on Instagram servers. Um, you reported it 
they said no to you. Um, mm -hmm. Now, at that point, um, some people could walk away. Some people could get um, argumentative, um, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Um, but you kind of reported back to them. And so and just said, I think you clarified, right? You asked them uh -huh. uh, for a little bit of detail. So uh, what's the advice there for their hackers? If they're A, you get a bounty that you're not kind of, um, you don't agree with, or B, mm -hmm. someone says, hey, that's not a vulnerability. Uh, what's your advice to them to, to have a similar outcome? Mm -hmm. Well, I always, in this particular case, actually Instagram sent me the wrong reply. They, they acknowledged afterwards, okay, this was the wrong reply. This was uh, destined for some, uh, some other report. <laughs> So, <laughs> okay, okay Sorry, I leave yeah. it in the middle where whether that's true or not. But yeah. um, what I typically ask first time when I get a rejection or like, sorry, when I get a, a normal rejection, I just ask um, for clarification. Okay, can you explain? Because I, I still think this is a an issue that that you might uh, address. Have you? I actually try to feel whether they have understood the actual problem problem that I'm trying to report or not. And in this case, they, they definitely came around and said, okay, this, this was a, a wrong reply from our side. We will address this. So this already solves it. Now, when you're really into a dispute about the bounty, honestly, that's still one problem of the, the bug bounty world as it is right now, I think, uh, especially with the unmanaged uh, bounty programs. Yeah. I've had a, a couple of bad experiences with them as well. Programs who announce that they will pay 10K for a critical vulnerability, and if you report it, he gets uh, one hundred dollars. Yeah, it's it's a bit sad because we as researchers we are not really protected against this. The platforms, if they are on a platform like Hacker One, Bugcry, they do their best, but in the end, it's it's the business who who will decide. And yeah, that's yeah. The only protection that I have is okay. If you have a bad experience with a program, a really bad one, just walk away. There's plenty of others. Yeah, and <laughs> that's that's basically how I deal with them because you can fight them, but in the end, you will you will give yourself a bit too much stress and uh, you will be frustrated and I think okay let's not invest too much time into that and invest time in, uh, in programs that, that really appreciate my reports but in the end I think this is still a problem of the, the bug bounty world that, that needs to be addressed I agree with you um, it's uh, it's definitely it's disappointing when mm -hmm. the result or the reaction is okay just don't work with them anymore right because mm -hmm. you've still invested your time um, and so that's that's kind of a challenge. Uh, yeah. What I what I would throw out, um, and just again, completely agreeing with you, where I've had success is uh, there have been a few times where I've had bounties which I thought I knew programs didn't have the money that say a Facebook <laughs> or a Google would have. I reported things, got a low payout, and my uh, the way that I handled it was I just asked them, can you help me explain how you came to this dollar amount? Um, and I do it respectively. I, you know, I would say I thought it would be worth a little bit more. Here's why. And then I have yeah. A, B, and C. This is what I would be able to do. Um, and I, I think for the most part, I've had success where companies come back and say, "We see the point. We apologize." You know, and then they bumped up or provided a bonus mm -hmm. or whatnot. That's not to say it's a hundred percent of the time, but I think if there's that respectful dialogue, um, kind mm -hmm. of like what you mentioned, um, you know, you might be successful. And then, alternatively, unfortunately. Um, Sometimes the answer is just to walk away. No, uh, exactly. The the case that I was describing is really the, the worst case, right? So if you go into a dialogue, you try to convince them with your arguments, which uh, can be can be legitimate or not, but you try to convince them, and they refuse it or they just stop answering. That's a moment where I think, okay, uh, let's not invest too many times and let's not uh, send like ten messages for explanation. If this is the case, I'll, I'll just spend my time somewhere else. But this is really the worst case I've had. A couple of uh, of cases as well where, where I thought the bounty was low, asked for the clarification, and they indeed bumped it up based on the argument that, that I've given them. So it really depends on the on the company you're dealing with. But I typically I don't stick with the company that are that that I don't really understand. In a, yeah. when I have a case like this, I, I just <laughs> it's sad, but I walk away. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's fair, um, and I I've been vocal on Twitter um, a couple times where it's come up. Um, and I've advocated for programs having to provide a payout table. Um, yeah. You know, maybe you still have the problem where they don't live up to the payout table. But again, in my mind, it sets the expectations to let us know mm -hmm. as hackers what they value, what they don't value. Um, and there are some great programs that do it ahead of time. Um, and so I, I think I would like to see that implemented because mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, it speaks to kind of what you're talking about, right? 
Yeah, yeah exactly. I also know that like book route has like the, the taxonomy, P1, 2, 3, 4, yeah. 5. And I think it's a, it's a good approach. Like if you have a P1, it will be in the top 20% of the maximum bounty amount. I think this is a valid approach and it does create some confidence between the research or for the researcher given the program. And this is something that uh, I would like to see adopted by, by all the bug bounty programs. Not really the taxonomy of bug route because you can always discuss taxonomies, but <laughs> it's a, like the payout table, even specific for companies to what they, to what they want to receive. I think it's a very good uh, suggestion and that would, that would help the community go forward at this point. Nice. So we'll, uh, we'll have to flag this conversation, specifically this moment for the sure. bug bounty pro platforms that are out there. Um, I'm not going to specifically name them because I feel like sometimes I do and then I get pinged by others like, hey, we're on a platform and then it's like, right. yeah, I'm not going to try to <laughs> play that game. Um, <laughs> so anyways, um, I, I've still got a whole list of questions that I can go through, <laughs> but we're, we're rounding out the hour here and I'm very yeah. conscious of your time uh, because again, I really appreciate it. Um, so one question that I have, um, I know we tabled the, the other piece around the competition because I want to come back to that as well. Um, but before we do that, I'm really curious, you've talked about it a bit right now, you look at um, authentication pieces and kind of playing with those. What does your approach to hacking look like right now? Um, if you had to summarize it, um, when you get invited to a new program, are you going around, are you peppering XSS payloads? Or are you sitting back and are you thinking through, okay, this is what I want to achieve. How can I go about doing it? What, what does that look like for you? What does your process look like? Well, to give you uh, some insight, if I get a, an invite for a new private program, the first thing I do is I look at the scope. If I see any wildcards in the domains, definitely the first thing I'll do is, uh, is look for the subdomains and check whether the session cookie of the top level domain is being shared because that would, that would increase my, uh, my odds and, and my impact for vulnerabilities on some domains. Yeah. Uh, one thing that, that is also interesting, it's not only the session cookie that I look at, but it's also sometimes with the CSRF implementation, right. they also store like the CSRF token in the cookie. And I've had cases where the CSRF token cookie from a top level domain also has this domain attribute set uh, to share it with all the subdomains. So if you find an XSS on a subdomain, you can steal the CSRF token from the top level domain. And you're going from an XSS on a on a silly subdomain yeah. to global CSRF uh, bypass on the top level domain, which is uh, a, a lot, uh, yeah, that, the impact is a lot higher at the bounty typically as well. Yeah. This is, this is the first thing I do. It's like scoping, but really scoping not only based on the subdomain, but also like the impact that I can get from the subdomains. And if, I, if, if it's all uh, configured well and, and cookies are not shared, I will focus more on the top level domain. If, uh, if the cookies are shared with the subdomains, I will definitely try to find some XSS on subdomain because they are typically easier to easier to find on on old subdomains that are are not routinely updated. Yeah. But they have a, a similar impact. So this is this one trick I, I'd like to share, and I, it's a, I have been quite successful with that. Uh, another thing I also typically do is if you have like only one domain in scope, also check check the cross domain.xml file in the root. Okay. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's like um, yeah. In a browser, you have the same origin policy where it's basically the segregation between tabs. So yeah. if tab A is open to arneswinden.net, tab B is open to, let's say, uh, yahoo.com. And I'm trying with my JavaScript in, on arneswinden.net to send a request to yahoo.com. It will succeed, an Ajax request, for example. But I won't, be, I won't get to see the response. The browser will add the cookies if I'm logged into Yahoo to the request. I just won't get to see the response, so I'm not allowed to steal information that, that I can see on yahoo.com from arneswinden.net. Mm -hmm. Now, the cross-domain.xml file in the root of a, of a domain, it actually allows to overwrite this same origin policy with a Flash plugin. Mm. And if the cross-domain.xml file, for example, specifies, okay, on yahoo.com, any subdomain of yahoo.com can make authenticated requests and read the responses, then suddenly a subdomain takeover or, or vulnerability on a subdomain suddenly also becomes more interesting. But these are typically the two things that I, I give a brief look when I, I see the scope. And that allows me to estimate, okay, the impact of a vulnerability on a subdomain, would it be high or not? And that's a bit of, like, it drives the, the decision of whether I will focus, whether I go uh, wide or whether I'll go deep on the, on the, on the program. Nice. That's, uh, 
I, I had not considered the CSRF token piece, uh, especially from the subdomain. So that is amazing. Um, that's uh, it's it's specific because not every CSRF implementation is like that. Yeah, uh, this is a specific implementation, but it's getting more and more popular because it's like transparent CSRF. Whereas in a normal implementation, you have to have a CSRF token in every form as a hidden post parameter. Yeah, and that's. That's sometimes built in in some framework, but in, in most frameworks it isn't yet. And typically they go for the easier option of issuing a, a token once and then letting JavaScript uh, sending it as a cookie and as a, a header or an additional uh, additional post parameter and just compare it on the server side. Where I've always looked for them, so I've always I've always looked for that as well um, for the CSRF token in the cookie, but only because from the perspective of those two different accounts, right? And so doing account uh, privilege escalation attacks because it makes it so much easier when you have Burp yeah. Suite open, you just, like, sometimes you don't know how the CSRF token is, is validated or used, uh, especially when they're dynamic per, yeah. per form. And so I usually look for those in the cookies because it just makes it so much easier uh, to start going through those privilege escalations. I, I, I don't know. It, you, the light bulbs are going off now. Uh, now that you've mentioned that, and it, it's so basic, um, but again, it's just one of those things where, if you don't know, you don't look for it. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. Sense. So, uh, again, thank you so much for the tip. Uh, that's an awesome one for uh, for myself and people listening. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, again, I'm just I'm trying to go over the key questions that I want to uh, uh -huh. cover because now we've gone over the hour mark. So I appreciate that and I apologize. Um, no worries. So that's essentially the advice. Um, let's go into the, the donation perspective um, mm -hmm. and let's talk about that and also the competition. Um, even the fact that you're, you're doing the interview, right? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously giving back to the community is, is, is key for you. So my question is kind of why? Um, can you tell us about the competition, what it is, why you started it, because you had to donate your time to do it, right, um, at a minimum, um, and then the donation with the bounties. Um, why give back so much to the community? Right, so when I first started bug bounty hunting, my main uh, motivation was, first of all, you can earn some extra cash, mm -hmm. and second of all, it would be nice to have, um, have like Facebook or Google on my CV as one of the companies where I, I found a, a buggy. For a penetration tester, you have two ways to differentiate. You have certificates, which are expensive, yeah. and like uh, being named in Hall of Fame of companies, hmm. which is a, a strong argument. So this, is, this was my initial motivation. Yeah. And when I started, I didn't expect to find a lot, to be honest. And the first payouts that I got were not very or extremely high. And also, um, actually, I'm involved with a non-profit organization in Belgium. Which, uh, which helps children in Ethiopia, uh, orphaned children. Yeah. And I know that's also why I chose Instagram, because Facebook Book Bounty Program, they, they match your donation if you donate it to a charity. So um, the first bounties that I received, around 4K, I believe, yeah. I, I told Facebook I would like to give them to a charity because I was not really in for it for the money at the moment, yeah. at the time. And they doubled it. And that's basically, I, I know the charity, I know they, they're doing good things with the, with the money. So that's basically, that was why I decided to, to give it a, give my third bounties to them. Now, uh, afterwards, uh, the sharing part, basically after a while I was, I kept on finding a couple of bugs in, uh, in Instagram and I figured, okay, this might be worth sharing uh, with the community because I've learned a couple of things from the community as well. And yeah, uh, it, was a, it was a good opportunity to give something back. I, I do like to, to share things. Yeah. Uh, so that's basically, when I decided to submit a presentation to B-Side San Francisco, because I was going there with my former employer to RSA conference, the, like big security conference, but, but more uh, a less technical one, but more high level one. So I was going to be in San Francisco anyway. So I figured, okay, I'll submit it. And that's actually how, how, the, how it got started, how the presentation thingy got started. Uh, now, the second question that you have is, okay, I also organized an event, the Cybersecurity Challenge Belgium, yeah. uh, for students. Uh, and this was actually, it was not me who organized it, but it was my employer who organized it. And I was uh, responsible for more technical parts, so making okay. challenges and, and inviting students to it. So it was, not, it was not all in my time, but it was like pay time from our employees. So I <laughs> yeah. just want to make that clear here. It's, a, <laughs> it's not my initiative. It was their idea, but I, I did contribute to it. And uh, basically it was... 
uh, in Belgium, we have a, a big shortage of uh, security skills, like talent. And it's, uh, I'm assuming it's, it's the case in most countries at this moment, because cyber security is hot, or the cyber, as some say. But uh, uh, basically, we wanted to, we, we really had a, my former employee really had a, an issue uh, with attracting talent or enough talent for, for the demand in the market. So they also wanted to hire people, right? Mm -hmm. Hire new, new talent and your new students who were studying IT into the security business because software development or, or security is, is becoming something completely different. It's really a niche. And that was one of the initiatives. So basically, it's a, it's a competition between students of all the universities and colleges in Belgium. They can sign up in teams of four, and it's basically a big CTF. Hmm. There's a first round of qualifiers, which is completely online and easy to participate in. And the top 10 teams, uh, after the qualifiers, they get invited to, to Brussels, our capital. Hmm. And yeah, like a real on-site event where they, again, uh, get some uh, CTF challenges that they, that they need to solve in, uh, in one day. And it's actually it's been a great success. The idea comes from the UK, where they have a cyber security challenge for like multiple years right now. I think four or five years that it's, it's been going there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we converted it to have it also in Belgium. And it really it really helps to convince students who didn't have any idea about potential jobs in security to to convince them to to have a look at it. And there have been a lot of students who told us uh, in retrospect, okay, we didn't even consider security as a as a way forward for our career, but we are now, and definitely, uh, yeah, a couple of them uh, I see regularly at, uh, right. at some meetings, so they, they really got convinced and, and entered the security market. So it's a, it's a good success story. Yeah. Nice, that's awesome. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, you, again, it's, it's the whole idea of having these conversations and then ideas and light bulbs kind of going off. Um, it would be really cool to see those kind of rolled out um, but yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned that it's employer driven, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it makes sense because obviously they develop talent that they can then try to recruit. Um, but at the same time, you're still helping the community. You're building that that knowledge base uh, mm -hmm. from a broader perspective. So that's really cool. Um, one question that struck me was so, and maybe this is it's one of the things that I've seen as a challenge participating in CTFs is that you have to have some type of baseline knowledge to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And so these are students that have a background, but are there any supports or were there any supports? Or do you guys have them on a roadmap in terms of maybe the people that are new kind of bringing them up? Or is that where write-ups from previous years help? Basically, we indeed have the write-ups of previous years, but also because it's uh, indeed uh, CTFs for beginners or people who don't have any security knowledge, we did not assume too much security knowledge. Okay. So basically, it's, for example, uh, one of the challenges was, here's a PCAP and uh, just enter the, the password that you find in one of the HTTP requests, things like that. It's not necessarily super security related. You don't need to be able to disassemble an Android APK and bypass as a cell pinning and stuff like that. That's, that's a bit too difficult for people without the knowledge. Yeah. But it were more like generic things to get them interested, to lure them in security. Okay. And in the, in the finals, the, the challenges were a bit more difficult, a bit more technical as well. But yeah, that, that definitely, we try to, to lure them in. That's basically the idea. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's cool. That's, I, I really like that idea. Um, and I like it that it's, that you kind of do it at that, I'll call it a macro level, the higher level, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's really neat. Um, it's, it's great to hear about that. So the last thing um, that I wanted to round out, and Arnie, again, I, I apologize that we've mm -hmm. gone so far over. If no you worries. have the time, I'll ask the question. If not, you can just tell I me. Have the time. Give me the quick minute and tell me to shut up. Um, <laughs> but I know that you've recently, and this wasn't on the list that we talked about before, but you've recently gone full-time, right? Um, yeah. You're looking at bug bounties now as full-time income. It seems to be a topic of conversation that continually comes up. Um, I see it coming from platforms, I think, because it's a great incentive to get people to continue to do more and the more you find, the more platforms make. Um, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, how has that worked out for you? What's the process been like? Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that you've learned um, at, you know, right off the start that you didn't know, that you didn't anticipate? Um, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, basically the story behind going full time is basically I've become a freelancer and right now I'm dedicating all my time to book bounties. Okay. It's not necessary that I'll, I'll be doing this for years and years, only book bounties, but for now, I've been doing it for a, a month, a month and a half almost. Nice. So, um, but I, I did think about it at first. So first, uh, what I recommend to people who are considering it at least is first build up a buffer. 
So okay. basically all the earnings I had from, from until this, this summer, I didn't spend them, but I, I put them aside to have a buffer. Yeah. Because if you're a freelancer or if you're really a full-time bug bounty hunter, you need to be able to, to pay your, your own salary each month. Yeah. And typically with bugs, it depends on the bug, how, how quickly they are fixed and also the bounty that you get. So you have a, a risk there or like the, the great unknown there. Yeah. So to get some, to be calm for myself and to, to not have too much stress, I figured out, okay, I'll, I'll have to make a buffer first. And it was convenient. Uh, I received some money from Facebook, I put it aside and now I, I found some use to it. Yeah. Um, basically, yeah, it's a thing, um, the bug bounty world, uh, finding bugs, it's something that I know for myself I like doing and I, yeah. I, will, not, I will not immediately uh, burn out or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, it's in my nature, I've been doing it for years and I, I still enjoy it very much. Whereas I've seen other people who, who tend to, to not like it anymore after a while, but I, I tend to be more intrigued after a while. So I know it's something for me, but that's, that's something that people should decide for themselves. But I know for me personally that that's, that's really a, a good fit, a good match at the moment. Um, from a financial perspective, it's always a bit of an uncertainty. Yeah. So that's, uh, that can be frustrating. Certainly in cases where you expect a high bounty and you get nothing or, or maybe uh, uh, a low bounty, it can be frustrating, but if you have it, I've had some other cases as well where your bounty is much more generous than you expect, it yeah. does make up for it. And, and in my case personally, I, I can only say that uh, I, in the end, the, the, the result is positive for me at the moment. So I'm, uh, I'm okay and I can pay my bills. <laughs> That's also important. But yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes, of course. It's, a, it's an experiment from my side, to be honest. That's awesome. Um, congratulations, uh, first off. Um, uh, again, um, it just, it, to me, when, like when you and I were talking, it just seemed awesome to me. Um, I, I've thought about doing that, but same thing, it's kind of the bills, and so uh, I really enjoy it right now, and I just I kind of want to stay at that place, but I'm always interested to hear kind of what the experience has been like for others. Uh, so it's great that it's working out for you. Um, and that you're enjoying it so much. Uh, that's awesome to hear. Again, thanks for sharing that. Um, so that kind of rounds out uh, the questions that I've had. Um, again, I, I, I can't thank you enough. You've really been an open book. Um, you're too friendly, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, not at all. It's, uh, it, I mean, for those listening, it does take a lot of time like away from you, uh, and especially when you're doing this full time, right? Like this is working hours for you and mm -hmm. you sit down, you, you've, you've donated that time again uh, for the community. So uh, yeah, on behalf of everyone listening and myself, I really appreciate it. Uh, it does mean a lot. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. And also I would like to stress that I'm indeed investing like two hours, but you on the other hand, you've done like eight interviews right now. You're <laughs> super active on Twitter. You're super, you're really, building this community and, and, and try to make it forward. So the thanks should be to you, not to me. Oh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's very kind. Thanks, Ernie. It's, uh, I mean, I have the, the motivation of learning. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a good motivator, I find. Um, yeah, but still, the time you've invested in the book and in these interviews, it's, uh, it's incredible. And you should be the one who should be thanked more regularly. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's very kind. Um, so yeah, on that note, Arnie, um, again, thank you. Uh, it's been awesome chatting, and I look forward to uh, seeing your name on more of the activity, uh, as mm -hmm. well as some blog posts. Uh, I look forward to reading those. So thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.